So, does anybody know who this is? This is Barbara Underwood, the Solicitor General for the State of New York. And in an absolutely clairvoyant 1979 article, Underwood discussed the use of individualized or clinical decision making versus the use of statistical inference in what she describes as two different ways of approaching the task of moving from evidence to facts. Algorithmic predictors are increasingly being used to score individuals, and as Underwood noted, even as early as 1979, important benefits and burdens are distributed in society according to these scores on the basis of these predictions, including release from prison, placement in schools and jobs, and the granting of retail credit. Now, the theory of algorithmic fairness as a field was launched in the summer of 2010 at Microsoft's Silicon Valley Research Lab. And we began, of course, with definitions. What do we mean by fairness? Because without definitions, we literally do not know what we're talking about. And we identified two major flavors of fairness guarantees, um, which we called group and individual. And I had not yet read Underwood's article, but these clearly echo the statistical inference versus individualized distinction that she was making in her article. So group fairness guarantees um, require some kind of relationship between certain statistics of decisions about typically disjoint demographic groups. So for example, Statistical parity would require that the demographics of the class of accepted students should look like the demographics of the, of the population as a whole, or of the applying population at least. In the context of assigning scores, um, balance for the positive class says that if we look at two disjoint groups, A and B, and we look at the average score that was assigned to positive members of A and the average score that was assigned to positive members of B, then those two should be the same. Okay. Those are just examples. So group notions are, of course, like the first place our minds jump to. And they're simple to state, and they're appealing, and they're natural, and they can even be pretty easy to achieve. But they have a lot of problems. So first of all, they can be specious. So um, uh, you might require that I advertise equally to groups A and B for my steakhouse. But if I send the ads to the vegetarians in A and to everybody in B, then clearly I'm going to have a B-centric, a B-heavy clientele uh, at my restaurant. The distributions of the populations in the two subgroups could be quite different. And group definitions permit, say, rewarding members of the minority that somehow are more assimilated or that look like the majority. Then there's the question of which groups should we be considering? So is there, in fact, just a small number of disjoint groups of people that should be considered when we're thinking about group fairness? And what about intersectionality? And who gets to decide which groups matter anyway? So that's very problematic. It's also surprisingly hard to test uh, group fairness in some cases. So um, a recent, well, 2019 paper in the annual Review of Criminology by Neil and Winship, argues that standard benchmarking and outcomes tests typically produce invalid inferences that, in their words, may diverge from reality in either direction, indicating discrimination when it is not present, or alternatively, indicating a lack of discrimination when it is, in fact, present. On top of all of this, though, is that 
very small numbers of absolutely natural desiderata, natural things that you would want in group fairness, are essentially mutually exclusive. So the group approach is problematic at best. So what about individual fairness? Individual fairness is very task specific. And so what you want is that if you have an algorithm, say for granting or deciding about retail credit, that people who are somehow or other similarly situated with respect to their ability to repay the loan should be treated similarly. But you, know, you and I may be very similar from that perspective. We may be wildly different in terms of uh, like, uh, deciding which books to be, to, should, be, should be advertised to us. So people who are similar in one way could be completely different in other ways. And individual fairness says that people who are similar with respect to a given, given classification task or a given scoring task should be classified or scored uh, similarly. So this, of course, has a very strong legal foundation. The idea that similar people should be treated similarly is at the basis of anti-discrimination law. But you have this problem again. Who is similar to whom? How do you decide for a given task who is similar to whom? How do you define it? Where do you get your hands on a similarity metric that tells you for a given pair of individuals and a particular task how similar or dissimilar these two individuals are? So that was a major stumbling block or you know, sort of big obstacle to overcome. But um, the community, after spinning its wheels for a while on this, did persist. And the last couple of years have shown some very, very nice results. Uh, in making progress along these lines. Yeah. Now, in an attempt to bridge this sort of gap between the group fairness definitions, which are easy to handle but are specious or problematic, and the individual fairness conditions, which make a whole lot of sense but are really, really difficult to work with because we don't have, we can't easily get our hands on a measure of how similar or dissimilar people are for a particular task. Um, two groups of researchers looked at a framework that I'm going to call multi-X. So in the multi-X framework, um, we have a large collection of sets pre-specified sets, but it could be very large. They could be arbitrarily intersecting. And the requirement is that whatever your group fairness notion is, it should apply simultaneously for all of the sets or all pairs of the sets. So the X here is going to sort of specify a group fairness guarantee. And the multi is to remind us that it's required to apply simultaneously to a large number of arbitrarily intersecting sets. Abra Johnson et al. studied what something that we'll be talking about quite a bit, multi-calibration of predictors. So they looked at the task of prediction. And uh, Kearns et al. were looking instead at classification. And they looked at um, uh, statistical parity and equality of false positive rates, for example. So that's kind of the fairness backdrop for some of um, for, for what I'm going to be discussing in the body of the talk. So now we need to move to individual probabilities. So as we said, risk predictors assign probabilities to individual instances, individual peoples, indi people, individual uh, bank loan applications, and so on. And examples would be. What's the probability that it'll rain tomorrow? What's the probability that this person, X, will repay the loan? 
what's the probability that this particular tumor will metastasize under a given course of treatment? What is the probability that individual Y will commit a violent crime in the next two years? So those are the things that the predictors are trying to predict. They're assigning numbers to individuals, and these numbers are interpreted as probabilities. And the problem is that this struggles to make sense. What is the probability of a non-repeatable event? We can't grant and loan, let time move forward, see whether X repays or not, rewind time, grant the loan again, see what happens, and, and so on, and get some kind of frequentist notion of the probability that X is going to repay the loan. That's not possible. So what is actually meant by this? First of all, if you don't know the answer, it's not surprising. This is a deep question that people in the philosophy of probability have been looking at for decades. But now let's think about an algorithm that is trying to produce scores. Maybe these scores are going to be used for life-altering decisions or, or, or deciding whether to lock somebody up. We can't say what they mean. We can't even say what is it that the ideal algorithm would be providing because we don't have a good notion of the probability of a non-repeatable event. So we can't even say what the ideal algorithm is doing or is striving for. And that's kind of the starting point for this work. So let's talk about the tumor case. Okay. So one way that people think about probabilities is they say, well, we're going to find these from binary outcomes data about tumors, looking at them, did they or did they not metastasize? So for example, here's a tumor. Here's um, some DNA in GCAs and Ts. And we look at one study, and in this study, we the study focused on certain locations in the DNA. Those are the locations in pink. Right? And among those in the study that looked like the given tumor on the locations in pink, let's say 70% metastasized. I'm just, these numbers are totally made up. Now, imagine there's another study. And in the second study, we look at these locations which are the ones in blue. And in the second study, the tumors that looked like this one, 40% of them metastasized with this course of treatment. So two things. Of course, we don't know what this means about this particular tumor that's in the intersection. But there's another really important lesson here that has absolutely nothing to do with tumors which is the way in which an individual instance is represented to the algorithms, the training data and the actual test data, the way an individual is represented can have a huge impact on the prediction. It is a vector for the introduction of bias. So we may say this in many different ways, but this is a clear example. Okay. So representations are really important. We're not going to do a lot with representations, but it's one of the most, it's the most fundamental, in my view, open area where nothing interesting has happened yet. So I want to highlight this for future thought. So if X is the set of sort of all possible instances, real people, let's say, we know that algorithms, they don't operate on people. They operate on the way the person is represented to the algorithm. So there's some mapping, some representation mapping, that takes instances and maps them down to some representation space. This is the only thing that the algorithm sees. Um, and of course, we could have distinct individuals being mapped to the same location. 
when that happens, we may get a whole bunch of people that are mapped to the same point in, in um, representation space. And then we could maybe come up with some frequentist notion for probability. But in this talk, I'm going to assume that the representations are very rich. They're not low dimensional. They're very rich. And so my representation mapping will not have collisions. So um, this is a good time to introduce my co-authors, Omer Reingold, Guy Rothblum, Michael Kim, and Galiona. And so here on the left, I have um, instances in real space uh, and some outcomes that are attached to them, labeled in gold. And then under the representation mapping, I have some kind of reduced picture of them. And the representation mapping can obscure critical elements. Now, I'm going to make an assumption or a modeling assumption. This actually is not necessary for our results at all. But it's the way I think about it. And my belief is that it can be helpful. So my assumption, modeling assumption, is the following. For every individual person I, there is a probability, a number, pi star, that is assigned to I by nature. And the outcome that I will experience eventually is drawn from a Bernoulli distribution with this probability. Now, some people don't believe in probability. They think that people are either inherently uh, you know, positive instances or negative instances. And if only had, we had enough information and enough computing power, we could know what the outcome were going to be. And things just look random because we don't actually have enough information and enough computing power. And the universe is deterministic. Okay. Other people are more comfortable with the idea that there is randomness. And you, know, you can choose wherever you want. It doesn't matter. The, re the results are, are, are robust to that. If you want to think that pi star is an integer, either 0 or 1, that's fine. Okay. Now, the probability is assigned to the instance. The algorithm sees the representation. Since there are no collisions, we can just think of the probability as attaching to the representation. OK, so what do we want from our prediction algorithm? Well, statistics has a really large literature on the problem, say, of forecasting, with the goal of finding probabilities that, in one way or another, look right. Finding probabilities that look right. So um, a lot of this is, say, framed in terms of weather forecasting. So imagine that every night, the forecaster gives a prediction, gives a probability of rain for the next day, uh, say 30% or 50% chance of rain. And then, of course, we see whether it rains or not on the next day. So the forecaster's predictions are said to be calibrated if the following holds. For every value v that the forecaster says, if we look at all of the days on which the forecaster predicted a v probability of rain, then in fact, on a v fraction of them, it should have rained. It's a very, very natural desideratum. If your forecaster is overly claiming about rain, you say, hey, you know, this is a bad forecaster. Or I know I have to discount this forecaster's predictions by 10%, or something like that. So you want not to have to do that. You want to be able to take the predicted value at face value and make your umbrella decisions accordingly. We'll talk a lot about calibration. I just want to comment that calibration does not imply accuracy. Why? Well, calibration, a calibrated predictor could be very, very, very minimal. So for example, suppose that year over year, the fraction of days that it rains stays more or less the same. 
So the predictor that just says what is the average over the entire year of the problem of the chance of rain on um, just that constant function is calibrated. It's not telling you something that's very interesting and that can help you with your planning. It's telling you essentially what happened last year and the year before that and the year before that. It, it's not useful for you. So calibration is desirable. It has been considered a sine qua non, but it is certainly not sufficient. Now, I said there was a, a big literature, and it's a delightful literature. Um, in, and here are just a couple of highlights that I want to mention in case you're interested in doing some further reading. Philip David in 1982 um, sort of emphasized the importance of calibration, and he would definitely not frame it this way, but what he, in our language, what he would be saying, one of the things he showed was that nature's forecasts are calibrated with probability one. Then Oakes in 85 showed that no deterministic forecasting sequence can be calibrated against all sequences of outcomes. In a 1985 paper, David made some really nice connections to definitions of randomness, which didn't actually, I, I didn't know about that until after we did this work, but it was nice to see that there too. And he showed convergence in the limit of predictions made by any pair of deterministic computable and what he called computably calibrated predictors. And he says this even suggests a notion of individual probability that's a different than frequentist notion. So in some sense, he was inspired by the same uh, questions. This is all for the online predicting case. Shervish in 1985 said, you know, Calibration, I mean, I, I didn't emphasize this here, but the calibration requirement is for infinitely long sequences. This means you can be as bad as you want for any finite prefix because you'll make up for it at infinity. And Shervis said, kind of, come on, guys. You know, these things may be completely useless before the sun goes cold, and so I don't care. Foster and Vora showed that randomness could circumvent Oakes' um, uh, negative result. Sandroni, Smorodinsky, and Vora, they didn't call it this, but they ended up showing that in the online setting, it's possible to be multi-calibrated with respect to countably infinitely many sets. Um, it's not that they had an efficient algorithm for this, but they showed that it's possible. And then Sandroni showed that if um, he showed how to construct a forecaster that can pass any test that nature always passes. So these are some of the highlights. Now, we've been talking about calibration in terms of the sequential setting. But we can also talk about calibrated predictors, prediction, for the batch setting, where you train on some set of instances, you build a predictor, and then you want to be calibrated on future, currently unseen, but future instances. So again, the definition is exactly the same. You build a predictor that takes us from representation space to the unit interval, and you require that for sort of the data that are not in the training set, that among those for whom you predict the value v, a v fraction of the outcomes will be positive. And among those for whom you, you assign the value w, a w fraction of the outcomes are positive. And we'll be t concentrating on the batch setting for the rest of the talk. So why am I talking so much about calibration and talk about fairness? Um, calibration was first introduced as a fairness criterion by Kleinberg, Molinathan, and Raghavan. And they did it, in some sense, they were emphasizing that they wanted predictors where the person who was receiving, I'm sorry, the person who was making a decision based on a prediction would not do any second guessing about what did the prediction mean if this individual about whom the prediction is made is in group A rather than in group B. So the key point of what I will call the two disjoint set calibration requirement that they posited, they proposed, is that the 
the, the predictor should be simultaneously calibrated, not just on the union of A and B, but on A all by itself, and if you looked only at the people in B, on B all by itself. And with that requirement, they get that there's no other thinking that you can do about the value V. The value V means exactly the same thing whether one is in group A or group B. Among all the people in A who are assigned the value V, V, a v fraction will have positive outcome. And among the ones in B who are assigned the value V, a V fraction will have positive outcome. OK, so that is how calibration kind of made it into the fairness um, world. And calibration on the union does not imply calibration on the subsets, even for the disjoint subset case. So this particular uh, predictions, which I have in red, um, um, that predictor is calibrated on the union of faculty and non-faculty among the authors, but it is not calibrated on either the faculty authors or the non-faculty authors. Okay. So in multi-calibration, the requirement is that for a possibly very large collection of sets of instances, the scoring function has to be calibrated on all of those sets simultaneously. So if you look at any one set all by itself, the predictor will be calibrated on that set. And that's true for all of them. Okay. So now you should be asking again that question that I mentioned earlier. Who chooses the sets? If this is a fairness guarantee, which are the sets that are kind of worthy of having it guaranteed for them that they will be, that the predictor should be calibrated on this set. Whose job it is to figure that out? So I was really struggling with how do I think outside the box when I'm trying to figure out which groups should be protected if we're listing a, a, a collection of groups. And I fell in love with this paper when I realized that, in some sense, they solved the problem for me. Because what they did was they said, let's let the collection of sets be determined based on complexity theory. So maybe these would be all of the sets that can be recognized by decision trees of height 6, or everything that can be, you know, whatever all small circuits, circuits of a certain size, all polynomial time circuits. Well, that's a little too hard. But nonetheless, that's the, the idea. So I really liked the complexity theoretic approach. And I should mention that one of the, the, the reasons that I was struggling with this is I was at Radcliffe. At Radcliffe, I hear talks about people, about work in totally different fields. And somebody was quoting the writings of a 17th century religious woman who said, I don't have a right to have an opinion on this because I'm just a woman. Now, I don't know whether she was being tongue in cheek or not, but the idea that she might have internalized the notion that she's not equipped to have ideas on this because she is only a woman made it clear that it's not right to require the various demographic groups to fight for themselves. And something automatic, like a complexity theoretic description, is, um, uh, uh, is desirable. Okay. So another thing that's worth commenting about in this work, which is that the role of the sets are twofold. One role is to name dem uh, demographic groups for fairness purposes. But there's a second role, which is also really important. And that is to sort of do the legitimate, correct separating that is separating the high probability of positive outcome instances from the low probability of um, uh, positive outcome instances. So to drive this point home, let's suppose that the overall base rate of a positive outcome is 2 thirds. And now choose a large random group, 
its average, its average rate is also going to be about two thirds. It's a random group, turn off, right? So we could be, if we choose just these groups that are orthogonal to what's actually the quantity of interest, and we just report for everybody the expectation for the, the group as a whole, not the universe as a whole, then this will be multi-calibrated. And that, as we saw before, that's just not that interesting. So to be a really useful predictor, you have to have useful sets. Okay. And of course, if you're doing the complexity theoretic approach, you're hoping that the collection of sets that you consider actually captures this you know, um, appropriately discriminating capability. Okay, great. So that's... Um, Prediction and fairness. So that's the crystal ball and the fairness. Now, is that a question? Yeah, use your speaker because I can't hear. Is this working? Uh, let's see. I think it's working. So um, with the multi calibration, is it that each group has the same outcome as everyone is seen in the world or as like that group is seen in the world? The requirement for multi-calibration is just that if you look at the predictor focused on that group, it will be calibrated. In the um, contrary example that I was just giving, where the sets were just chosen randomly with no relation to what it is you're trying to predict, then the even though individual probabilities could be quite different, the average for the population will be the average over your random subset, or very close to the average over your random subset. And so you could be, for any random subset, and for multiple random subsets. So, you know, fix a collection of random subsets, report the population average for everybody, then, at the, then it will follow that for each of those random subsets, that is a calibrated predictor on that subset. So we get multi-calibration with respect to this collection of random subsets. Okay, but for like a non-random subset, but like for example, right. like the subset of women, then right. the predictor would be... Well, what we, you know, maybe we're in a situation where being a woman is completely orthogonal to the thing you're trying to predict, and you would expect. If you're trying to predict something about number of children that this person may bear, then being a woman would be quite relevant. And you would expect that it would, the, you know, your predictor here would be different than the, um, you couldn't just use the population of men and women combined average. You would need to, ha you would, your, your predictor would look different on that subset. Okay, I think that makes sense. I guess the reason I'm ask asking is about kind of like historical, um, data being biased. Great. And, okay. Great. So um, I will talk about that quite a bit toward the end of the talk. I'd like to pend it now and ask you to ask again if I don't address it. Okay? Cool. Thank yes. you. But you're, you're, you've nailed it. Like, there's a really important point there. Okay. So randomness and pseudorandomness. So a sequence of bits is random if the next bit is completely unpredictable and there's absolutely no pattern to the bits. It's pseudo-random if there is no discernible pattern or there's no efficient prediction method. Um, there could be an inefficient prediction method, but there's no efficient one. So pseudo-random sequences are created by a pseudo-random generator that stretches a short, truly random seed to create, with no additional randomness, a longer output sequence that still, quote unquote, looks random. And now you have to say, looks random to whom? So if you're the person who is trying to determine whether it looks random or not, if that person has tremendous amounts of computational power, they may know very well that this is pseudo-random. But maybe we're happy if it looks pseudo-random, if it, if, if it looks random, even though it isn't truly random, it looks random to algorithms that run on a 1980s HP calculator in less than 24 hours, 
or to neural nets of three hidden layers and width 256, or for decision trees of height 6, or what we normally have in cryptography is all polynomial time algorithms. So just as pseudo-random sequences look random to a given class of algorithms, we're sort of seeking predictions that look right to a given class of algorithms. So to understand this, we need a notion of a history or a transcript. And this is just a list of prediction and outcome pairs. Um, so prediction probability and what actually happened. Prediction probability two and what actually happened, and so on and so forth. And we also need the notion of a distinguisher. So that's a fancy word that takes as input, for, for an object that takes as input a history and just says zero or one. That's its entire functionality. Takes a history, says yes or no. Prediction indistinguishability with respect to nature is the following. In the language of complexity theory, we might say that the previous thrust, the thrust of all of the work that I was talking about until now uh, in the uh, statistics literature, is to find an algorithm, a predictor, P tilde, whose predictions in modern language are indistinguishable from those of nature in the following sense. So now we have two experiments. In the experiment on the left, we have histories which have nature's predictions paired with what actually happened, nature's outcomes. So those are outcomes that were drawn according to the Bernoulli distribution with whatever probability nature had assigned. That was our model. So we feed a bunch of histories like that in, and the distinguisher says 0 or 1 for each history, and we can talk about a probability that it says 0 or 1 over this choice of history. In the experiment on the right, we have again, no, we have again nature's outcomes, but we're pairing them now with the algorithm's predictions. So the algorithm makes a prediction, not nature. The algorithm makes a prediction, nature gives an outcome. The algorithm gives another prediction, nature gives an outcome. So that also can give us a history. And we can look at a bunch of histories of that type and see on what fraction does the distinguisher say one. If this fraction on the left is very different than the fraction on the right, then D is a successful distinguisher it distinguished histories where the predictions were nature's versus when the predictions came from the algorithm. And basically it says, you know, this algorithm wasn't up to snuff. Okay? That's what being a distinguisher, like a successful distinguisher. If that doesn't happen, if the two probabilities are very close, then we say that the algorithm has fooled this distinguisher. So, we have a predictor because we built one, and we have a distinguisher because it's sitting on a shelf. And we want to know, is it the case that we have prediction indistinguishability? Can we test? And the answer is no, of course we can't test. Nature doesn't tell us what its probabilities are. We don't even know if they're non-integer. We can never get our hands on those P stars. So we can't test this. So, how do we handle this? We handled this with a shift in perspective. So we introduce a new notion, which we call outcome indistinguishability. And as it turns out, the new notion implies the old one in all of the cases that were studied in the statistics literature, but it's stronger. So we're not cheating by introducing this new notion. And in the new notion, Again, we have two experiments. And again, in each experiment, we have the distinguisher, and it takes histories, and it spits out outcomes. But the histories are created differently than in the previous slide. So in the experiment on the left, we have the algorithm's predictions paired with nature's outcomes. We saw that before. In the experiment on the right, 
we have the algorithm's predictions. But now, instead of pairing them with nature's outcomes, we draw an outcome according to the Bernoulli distribution that P tilde tells us to use. And so we draw the outcomes from the P tilde distribution instead of P star distribution. So on the left, we have algorithms, predictions, nature's outcomes. And on the right, we have algorithms, predictions, and a kind of simulated outcome in the world that the algorithm has described. And we're asking the same question. Can this distinguisher tell the difference? Now, we have our hands on the distinguisher, and we have our hands on P tilde. We can always draw from um, uh, the Bernoulli distribution with some particular um, input um, probabilities. So yes, we can actually carry this out. So we've shifted. And you can see um, here, you can see what we had before, what was studied in the stats literature versus what we shifted to. So this is our version of individual probabilities that look right. Outcomes drawn from the forecaster's predictions are indistinguishable from those produced by nature. With this, um, yeah, OK. So there's a wonderful video on YouTube of a lecture by Richard Feynman in which he talks about how new laws of physics are developed. First, he says, you guess the law. That's where the physics comes in. Next, you compute the consequences of your law. And finally, you design experiments and you compare the computed consequences uh, to your experimental observations. If your computed consequences disagree with your observations, then Feynman says, your law is wrong. In that simple statement, he says, is the key to science. He also notes, by the way, that if your experiments do accord with your predictions, you still don't know whether your law is right. You might maybe go ahead and compute more consequences and test again. So it's not yet disproven. Now, we think of our algorithms, P tilde, uh, as a scientific theory. And it's, uh, it's a theory whose predictions, we hope, will yield a, when we, that yield a generative model for outcomes. Given the representation I, the predictor hands us P tilde I, which is a generative model for OI tilde. Now, When the class of distinguishers is the collection of all polynomial size circuits, the requirement would say that the behaviors predicted by the theory can't be distinguished from the behaviors of the real world. And there's no feasible way to falsify such a theory. Okay? We're not going to quite get there, but we like this because what we want from our predictors is that they should tell us what to see. And if the reality diverges, we need to change the predictor. We need to update it and fix this. And that process actually works. OK, so with that point of view, we actually get a hierarchy of outcome indistinguishability definitions, which vary according to the degree of access that the distinguisher has to the predictor. So the bottom two levels the distinguisher just gets the representation of the person and the outcome, where the outcome is either drawn according to P tilde or the true outcome. In sample access, the distinguisher actually gets to see what did the algorithm predict for this individual. But you can go further. You could ask, for example, at the very top, you could say, the distinguisher wants to see all of the code for the algorithm. Thank you very much. And it's going to take all of that into account when it's decide when you know you, you're trying now to fool a very educated distinguisher. And there's a sort of middle ground where the distinguisher can sort of make up people or describe people and say, what would you have predicted for those people? 
and that's called Oracle Access. Clearly, if you have code access, you can simulate Oracle Access. And we ask whether there are outcome indistinguishable predictors of complexity independent of that of nature. And the answer is yes for the lower levels and using some results um, from complexity theory, no for the upper levels. And it turns out that the lower two levels correspond to some notions that were uh, multi-calibration and a simpler notion defined in the same paper by Aber Johnson et al. of um, uh, what's called multi-accuracy. So there's a real life application for this. Um, risk assessment in criminal justice. So when you have many, many states now, more than half states are using uh, risk assessment tools, uh, often to determine whether someone should be allowed out on bail. And many people want access to the algorithms because they want to understand, is the algorithm fair or is it not fair? And what these results say is that access to the predictor matters, to, to the algorithm in some sense, ac access matters. And by the way, the objection to this is, oh, this is proprietary software. We couldn't let you see it. Okay. So California Proposition 25, which was defeated, was a referendum on a law that replaced cash bail uh, for certain kinds of charges with um, automated risk assessment, and it required annual fairness auditing. So the upshot of the results from the previous slide is that, at the very least, the auditors should be given Oracle access to the algorithms. All right, very last couple of minutes. This line of work on outcome indistinguishability arose in the context of algorithmic fairness, and I hope I was able to trace the roots of that for you. Coming back to your question, outcome indistinguishability is descriptive. It's not aspirational. It's telling you about the world as it is, and that mm, that is the world that's reflected in the data. If the data have bias in them, then the algorithms that are trained on those data will imbib, imbibe those biases. So at, from a fairness perspective, what we would hope for is that we would learn from the data about the real and unfair world as much as we possibly can, and then try to adjust. Now, how would we do, how would we go about adjusting from, how do we even think about this problem? So I'll tell you the beginnings of how we're thinking about it. So imagine an ideal world where everybody is supported and able to reach their maximum potential. And that is going to be the world of Q-star, and it's on the right here. And there's this terrible transformation um, that takes the ideal world and moves it to the real world, P star, which is not a good world. It's not a nice world. And we want to try to understand, we want to try to like produce something that looks like Q star, or at least is indistinguishable from Q star. But we don't know how to do it, especially because these transformations probably destroy information. For example, Stereotyping, where you take many different people who are very varied and you place them all into one bin and you stop distinguishing. Um, that's not invertible. You can't, you know, the information has been destroyed. Other kinds of transformations um, can be more reversible. Sort of a systematic down weighting or a systematic up weighting. These can be reversed. Um, now, suppose having some kind of understanding of how the world works, we could come up with some kind of a mapping, which I'm going to call tau. Ideally, tau would be the inverse of t, but t may be uninvertible. But tau somehow should, like if we could apply it to P star, we would get at least closer to the ideal. 
Of course, we don't have P star. That's why we had to introduce outcome indistinguishability. But we get samples that are drawn according to probabilities that are produced by P star. And because we have those samples, we have training data, and that's how we were able to build some predictors, P tilde, that are indistinguishable from P star. We'd love to do the same thing on the right side of this over here. But we don't have any samples from the ideal world. Because the world isn't ideal, so we don't have them. So the samples drawn from Bernoulli of Q star are just not available to us. We have P tilde. So if we have some idea of what tau might look like, some tau that would get P star closer to Q star, what happens if we apply tau to P tilde? What can we say about tau of P tilde versus, sorry, uh, yeah, tau of P tilde versus tau of P star? Are these indistinguishable? Under what conditions are they indistinguishable? What about Q star? When can you actually convert and get samples from Q star? And that's a line of work that I've been developing together with Guy Rothblum and Omar Reingold. So, sorry, that doesn't belong here. Okay, final remarks. We discussed outcome indistinguishability, which is a desideratum for individual probabilities. This is a really active area. If you're here in the workshop at all in the next couple of days, you'll see at least two talks, maybe three. Um, there are many applications of sample access OI or multi-calibration that actually go beyond fairness. There's some, there's some correctness conditions and optimality conditions that are very exciting uh, new developments. As we've discussed, the collection of distinguishers matter. What you should be testing for matters. And uh, how to choose it, um, is a very interesting line of research in which there has been some progress very recently. As I flagged at the beginning, the problems introduced by the representation mapping are absolutely central, and I don't know of any substantive work on this. And finally, there's this meta problem, which is when should scoring be used, and when should it not be performed? And on the basis of what information and representation, nothing that I've talked about addresses either the question in blue or the question in red. Thanks. <laughs>